So today we're talking about cosmetic surgeries for pets. And um, just a quick note that uh, in today's presentation, we are going to be talking about several procedures that some people um, find inhumane. So these are uh, difficult things to talk about, but uh, we're not going to be showing any real pictures, nothing graphic. There's just a couple of um, medical drawings to show what these procedures entail so that you can make informed decisions and um, make the right choice, the humane choice for um, any animals. Um, so we'll get started talking about cosmetic procedures. So cosmetic surgery is basically just a medical procedure done solely for the sake of appearance. Um, a lot of people refer to cosmetic surgeries as plastic surgery when we're talking about different things humans uh, can get done. Um, and some cosmetic surgeries may have certain medical benefits, but overall they focus more on changing the appearance and uh, normally don't improve the patient's health. Um, elective surgeries are a little bit different. All that it means if a surgery is elective is that it's non-emergency, um, but the condition, while not life-threatening, must be addressed at some point. So um, just another important note for today's topic, spay and neuter are elective surgeries for animals. If you remember, we've talked about spay and neuter, and that's um, a surgery for uh, cats and dogs so they won't be able to reproduce or have babies. Um, however, this is still an important surgery to have. It's not because we want the animals to look a certain way. There are medical and behavioral benefits to spay and neuter. So they are necessary, just not life-threatening, making them an elective surgery. Whereas the procedures we're going to be talking about today are all cosmetic surgeries. And then obviously urgent or uh, emergency, emergency surgeries are anything for life-threatening or life-altering situations um, such as trauma, like if an animal was hit by a car or when humans have appendicitis, anything that needs to be addressed immediately so that um, that person or animal can still live a full life or um, the best life possible. So animals and cosmetic surgery, some important things to note before we get into any details is obviously um, humans get to make the choice if they want to have plastic surgery. So whether that's for something um, that they just feel insecure about or maybe it's um, something that uh, they feel is different, but they're making the choice. They're the ones who see the plastic surgeon and go through um, all the information and paperwork in order to have that procedure done. Whereas animals, obviously, don't get a say. Humans choose to have these procedures done on them. So animals aren't aware that um, you know their tails might be docked or that um, cat's claws might be removed. They never consent to this. So that's a big difference between cosmetic surgery in people and cosmetic surgeries in animals. And uh, remember that cosmetic means that it's done solely for appearance. There are pretty much no medical or practical benefits from any cosmetic procedures. Um, so animals aren't improving their quality of life after cosmetic surgeries. And a lot of the time these surgeries or procedures um, can actually cause more harm uh, to the animal than good. So uh, most of these cosmetic procedures exist because it helps an animal fit into the breed standard or basically how that breed of dog or cat is supposed to look or people expect them to look. So examples of this are tail docking, um, which we're going to talk about each procedure in a little more detail, but tail docking is removing a portion of the tail. Ear cropping is um, shaping, reshaping an animal's ears and dew claws are um, almost like a thumb, a non-useful thumb on animals. It's a little claw that kind of hangs off the inner front leg of uh, some breeds of dogs and cats. But um, other procedures are even worse in a lot of ways because they take away a certain instinct that an animal has um, that people might find a nuisance for some reason, or maybe they don't understand that this is an important instinct for this animal to have. So declawing cats and debarking dogs are definitely procedures that take away a very natural insti 
in instinct from an animal and leave them um, defenseless in certain ways and really have awful, awful negative effects because it's um, so life altering for dogs and cats. So we'll start by talking about declawing cats since most of the other procedures are more commonly done on dogs. Um, a cat declaw or forgive me, I'm going to try my best. On it, Aniectomy is a surgical procedure that removes the last bone in the feet of a cat. So please note that this is the last bone. It is not simply just removing the claw or nail, which is made of keratin and can grow back. If, you know, we were to um, have one of our nails fall off, it would likely grow back. Same thing um, if you have cats with claws at home, you'll probably notice um, sometimes they have little pieces flake off and that's totally natural. Um, but declawing is an amputation of the first digits or toes, um, which are the phalanges. People have phalanges. So if you um, see this picture here, declawing is basically the equivalent of cutting off that first little digit on your finger. Those are the phalanges or phalanx. And um, in order to remove the nail bed of a cat, the entire phalanx has to be removed. So it would be like chopping off the nubs of your fingers. Um, so here you can see the medical drawing where this is an intact um, cat's claw and this is the part that large part with the nail and the phalanx is removed. So this is done uh, while a cat is under anesthesia. Uh, sometimes they'll use guillotine nail clippers, which are um, extremely harsh nail clippers that just do a quick chop. Um, scalpel blades or uh, carbon dioxide lasers are used to amputate the last digit of each toe and cats may uh, undergo front and or back declaws. Um, so the declaw results in no claws because we removed the entire digit including the nail bed um, and also smaller feet after the surgery is complete. Obviously this takes away a cat's main defense so um, they would be helpless if they ever were to get into a fight with another animal. Um, so if a cat doesn't have its claws, it really has no way to defend itself. And it's obviously going to be scared and um, definitely vulnerable if it were to accidentally get outside or have an encounter with another animal. Um, and obviously, if uh, you could imagine having um, parts of your finger for them to walk or stretch because those bones are so sensitive after being amputated. So imagine, you know, trying to walk on um, be um, very, very painful. And uh, due to the painful recovery, we see a lot of behavioral problems that can arise as a result. Um, litter box issues are uh, often caused by the pain that the declawed cat experiences when going to the bathroom. Since it's painful for them to stand after the amputation is done, they might associate that pain with the litter box. And um, even though uh, their feet might heal up, they still always have that memory of pain and going to the litter box. So they'll refuse to use it properly because they've made that association. Um, that's definitely a big, big issue we see in any cat that has been declawed. Um, and actually, litter box issues or um, inappropriate elimination is one of the main reasons why uh, cats are relinquished to shelters um, for behavior reasons. So um, if we don't declaw cats, then they're less likely to uh, develop litter box issues and less likely to end up in shelters. Aggression and biting are um, other common, really common behavior problems from uh, declawing cats. And once again, this is because their natural defense of their claws isn't an option anymore. So biting is pretty much all they have left, right, as a last resort. So uh, cats that have been declawed are much more likely to bite without much provocation just because claws are kind of that um, nice defense where it's a warning, right? If you just get scratched a little bit, you'll probably leave the cat alone. Whereas now they don't have that defense, the only option is to bite. Um, Declaw surgery can cause chronic pain, nerve damage, 
obviously there can be complications and possibly even disfigurement of the feet. Um, and not to mention, it's just simply inhumane and unethical, right? Cats are born with claws for a reason. It's something that they have naturally and they have a natural instinct to scratch things. It's our job to understand that and provide them with things that we want them to scratch. And uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association, or the AVMA for short, discourages declaw surgery. Um, and nowadays, many veterinarians refuse to even perform the operation to begin with. So things are improving. When I was younger, you know, um, we're thinking like at least 10, 15 years ago, many more people um, would get their cats declawed. But today, a lot of people are aware of the really bad side effects that can result and uh, uh, they're also aware of how inhumane and um, wrong it is for us to simply alter an animal um, because we want it to be a certain way to begin with. So luckily it's become much less um, common for people to declaw their cats but it is still out there and um, that's why it's important for us to understand the risks and what it actually does to the cats. Um, and like I mentioned, if you are a cat owner and you just provide options for your cat to scratch, it likely won't scratch um, unwanted objects. So um, make sure that it has a scratching post and sometimes it might take a little bit of figuring out what types of materials your cats like to scratch. Um, when I first brought my cat home, we you know, had different toys ready to go and we had a cardboard scratch pad and she just didn't care for that. She it wouldn't give at the time of day, even if we put a little bit of catnip, sometimes that can entice cats and show them where they should scratch. But um, then we got a scratching post similar to the one in this picture here. It's like rope around the pole there and carpet on the bottom. And we learned that those are the materials that she prefers to scratch. So um, we make sure that she always has access to her scratching post. Also, um, pheromones can help calm cats in the home and um, lessen the desire for them to scratch unwanted objects. Um, frequent nail trims are important just to um, keeping cats nice and hygienic, but it will help prevent um, the claws from becoming too sharp or causing damage to anything. So we actually here at Naperville Area Humane Society do free nail trims for anyone who's adopted a cat from us. Um, because we want uh, our adopters to be able to have that service and not feel stressed out about it. There's also some other options. So um, some cats might still be curious and um, try to put their paws on things. So there's double-sided tape called sticky paws and it's made um, for cats. It's like I said, double-sided tape. So one side sticks to your furniture or wherever the cat is scratching and you don't want them to scratch. And then when they go to put their paws on it, it's sticky on the other side. Um, so it deters them. They don't like that sticky feeling. And then there's also kitty caps. Um, so they're basically just nail caps where um, you can put them on. Sometimes you do need the help of a veterinarian at least the first couple of times. They kind of have to be fitted to the cat and put on a special way, but they stay on for usually a few weeks at a time until the nail starts to grow long enough and then they'll pop off again. But um, it's a great way to prevent any damage, um, keep nails nice and uh, protected, and they come in tons of different colors. So it's a fun way to make sure that your cat still has the ability to scratch, but they're not going to do any damage wherever they're doing it. So next we'll talk about debarking slash devocalization. Um, devocalization, debarking, devoicing, or bark softening are pretty much uh, similar terms for uh, the same procedure. And the surgery involves removing the vocal cords so that a dog cannot bark or will have a quieter bark. Um, devocalization can also be performed on cats, but it's much more commonly perf uh, performed on dogs. So a ventricular cordectomy removes laryngeal tissue with a biopsy tool in order to cause enough damage to the vocal cords that will result in like a raspy cough-like sound. So the dog will likely still try to bark, but the vocal cords have been damaged or severed to the point where it's not gonna make a lot of noise. So it tends to sound almost like a raspy cough or much more subdued bark. Um, and you can kind of see in the medical drawings here that they go in through the dog's mouth um, 
there's the larynx. If you have ever had laryngitis, um, that's the same area uh, that they're operating on down there. It's where the vocal cords are, and they basically are cutting part of them um, to make it so the dog can't bark. So obviously recovery is difficult and can cause different complications, just like any surgery, bleeding, acute airway swelling, infection, coughing, gagging, and aspiration pneumonia are specific to the debarking surgery though, because of the way that it's done and that they have to go in through the animal's mouth a lot of the time. Um, and dogs who have been debarked risk developing scar tissue and glottis stenosis, which is basically narrowing of the throat and likely um, can lead to respiratory distress, noisy breathing, exercise, and or heat intolerance. So basically, um, if there's complications or um, they develop scar tissue after the surgery, it's likely to cause other problems with breathing and um, anything resulting from the narrowing of the throat and airways. That's obviously not a good thing. You want an animal to be able to exercise and obviously dogs enjoy being able to bark and express themselves. Uh, sometimes the vocal cords are able to heal somewhat, but um, usually they'll uh, kind of give a little bit more volume back to the bark, but um, it doesn't always go back to full volume. Um, and this kind of means that the surgery isn't even entirely effective. So some people might have the procedure done again, and that would be especially traumatic for a dog. It's already traumatic to undergo any surgery and then to have your voice taken away from you. Um, it starts to come back a little bit and then somebody takes you to have that same procedure done again. That's got to be um, extremely difficult for a dog to deal with. So there's really no point in debarking or devocalization to begin with when it isn't effective and it's taking a pretty important means of communication away from an animal. We're gonna talk about that. So obviously debarking a dog is inhumane because um, like we mentioned, that's the ways that they communicate, right? Uh, it's taking away their ability to express themselves. So that causes a lot of distress and lasting behavioral damage. Um, just imagine if you woke up and couldn't talk to anyone anymore. You know, dogs rely on their bark as a defense as well. Um, so that's why we talked about body language several weeks ago. Barking and growling are um, some of the only warning signs aside from their body language that a dog may bite. So if they're not able to bark or growl to let people know, hey, I don't like this, I'm ready to defend myself, then people are more likely to get bit. Um, so really it's dangerous for both uh, the dog and the person to take away their only means of communication. So, and not to mention, once again, it's inhumane. In my opinion, um, declawing and debarking are basically like whipping, ripping the wings off of a butterfly, right? Animals were born this way for a reason, so it's not right for us to make those changes just because we don't want to deal with something or we think it's better a different way. So some people who argue for debarking often say that it solves excessive barking issues, but actually excessive barking is usually the result of an underlying issue. So the debarking surgery won't fix the problem. And once again, if you're taking away that means of communication, it'll probably lead to other behavioral issues and make the problem worse. Uh, and one study um, found that 84% of dogs involved in neighborhood nuisance barking complaints, so any dog that um, has taken part in excessive barking and was reported, you know, by their neighbors to the township or whatever it might be, um, this study looked at all those types of uh, reports and they found that in a majority, 84%, those people were confining the dogs to their backyards and leaving them alone. So the dogs had, in their mind, obviously, a good reason to bark. They're locked in a backyard with um, very little stimulation. Their owners aren't around. So if anything walks by or catches their attention, they're likely to um, excessively bark because they don't have the proper stimulation or care at that point in time. So it's interesting that the study found that really the problem with uh, nuisance barking often relates back to the owner and what we're doing for, you know, our pets, whereas it's not the dog's fault that they were locked in the backyard.
And uh, there's much more effective ways of uh, dealing with excessive barking issues, environmental manipulation, enrichment, training, behavior modification, and sometimes even medication are all much more effective and will actually get to the root of the barking issue instead of just saying, oh, we're going to have a quick fix and, you know, take away the means of communication, which will, once again, likely just make all of the behavioral issues worse. So it's much better to tweak things a little bit at a time or in extreme situations, um, medication like sedatives um, might be uh, recommended, but never taking away something that's natural to an animal. So next we're going to talk about ear cropping, tail docking, and dew claws. So this is more um, purely aesthetic, um, cosmetic type of surgeries. <laughs> Holly is getting very excited back here. So ear cropping um, or trimming is a surgical procedure where the ear pinna, that's the floppy part, is cut and shaped in order for it to stand upright. So cosmetic autoplasty is done under an general anesthesia, but the puppies are usually pretty young, anywhere from 6 to 12 weeks old at the time of surgery. Um, so it's something that happens very young. The idea is that um, they might not be able to feel pain at this age, but there's no evidence to say that that's true. And actually a lot of veterinarians think that there might be other um, different types of effects from having a procedure like that done at such an early age that it might affect the pain receptors. So um, in order for the ears to heal in the desired upright position after the surgery is done, they are posted to a hard surface and taped until completely healed. So you can see in the pictures down here, um, some dogs that had their ears cropped and now they have to be taped to promote that healing in the upright position. Um, but bandages need to be changed weekly and very frequently to prevent infection. So the entire recovery takes anywhere from four to eight weeks. Uh, cropped ears can become infected just like um, any surgery. It's uh, prone to infection, but also can cause phantom pains. Um, and basically phantom pains are a sensation that something is in pain that's not there anymore. So someone who might have had a limb amputated, but they still feel like there's a pain in that hand that's no longer there. Um, same thing with dogs that have had their ears cropped. They feel a pain in the part of the ear that is no longer there. And obviously some other complications can arise as well. Um, for the most part, Ear cropping is done entirely for the cosmetic benefit or to fit the breed standard of what a dog should look like. Um, there really are no medical benefits. Some people say that dogs with cropped ears are less likely to get infections of the ear canal, but um, we, the research has shown that floppy, heavy hanging ears are somewhat more prone to getting infections, but there's no evidence saying that ear cropping prevents those infections. So yes, floppy ears are more likely to get infected, but cropping doesn't seem to make much of a difference. And the dog breeds with the floppiest heavy hanging ears um, do not have cropped ears as part of their breed standard. So that's just kind of an interesting, silly claim because uh, those who are getting the infections aren't the ones having their ears cropped. Uh, other claims people might make are that it prevents injury and improves the dog's hearing, but there's no support uh, or evidence to these claims according to the American Veterinary Medical Association. So tail docking is another very common uh, cosmetic procedure for pets. Um, basically, they cut off the tip of an animal's tail um, technically, it is an amputation and consists cutting between the bones um, to shorten the tail's length. The amount that is cut off depends on the dog's breed or animal's breed, since tail docking is done in other species, but for the most part, um, we're talking about different dog breeds. Uh, and there are dogs that have like nubs <laughs> for tails, and those are technically called bob tails, and those are naturally occurring. They're not docked. Um, but there are a good number of other breeds that are born with long tails that are shortened or cut off as part of the breed standard. So tail docking is usually done, once again, on puppies when they're super young. 
Um, occasionally it's done in adult dogs, but for the most part, it's done at a very early age um, so that they don't have to put the animal under anesthesia. Um, and once again, a lot of experts are um, starting to understand or see that painful procedures done early in life change the way that pain is processed in the brain. So um, basically, they hypothesize that um, if an animal or really anybody undergoes a lot of pain at a young age that um, it won't be able to understand that pain at a later point. So they might not be as likely, while pain is a bad thing, it's also good because it lets you know if something is wrong with your body. And if animals have had painful, painful procedures at a young age and change the way their brain reacts to it, they might not um, be as attentive to when their body is telling them something is what um, experts are starting to look into and find in some of these cases. So dock tails can actually develop a neuroma, which is a nerve tumor, which causes pain and sensitivity to the tail region. So a dog might be, um, you know, more likely to snap or be really sensitive around that area if anyone was touching it because they developed a neuroma after tail docking. So um, once again, tails are important for communication. So dock tails may hinder a dog's ability to interact with other animals. Um, they definitely are looking for signals with their ears, um, eyes, their posture, tail, and then um, vocalization are the main ways that animals communicate to each other. So we you know, don't want to interfere with that and um, confuse dogs just by docking their tails for appearance reasons. Um, historically, the argument for tail docking was to prevent injury to working dogs' tails. Um, they said that for dogs that hunt type of thing, um, if they were to get stuck somewhere, um, it would be bad to pull on the tail if it were at full length, whereas a dock tail won't cause as much damage. However, a majority of dogs that are kept as pets today are not used for herding or hunting whatsoever, and there's very li little evidence um, that says that docking prevents these types of injuries anyway. They're just as likely to get injured with a dock tail or non dock tail. So in very, very rare instances, a tail amputation might be, is different and might be necessary after a traumatic injury to the tail where full repair is not possible or there's some kind of detrimental deformity going on with the tail. Like some dogs have what's called happy tail where they get so excited they literally will um, bang their tail so hard against the wall where it bleeds or can even break the bone. So that might be a medical reason for a tail amputation. However, tail docking for appearance is much different. So hopefully you guys understand that um, all the procedures we're talking about today are done for cosmetic reasons. Whereas maybe in, you know, one in a hundred or one in a thousand dogs, a tail amputation would be necessary for a medical reason or injury. So dew claws, um, this isn't as common, but it still is something that you might hear or um, that people do try to remove the dew claws um, in their pets from time to time. So dew claws are basically the last digit on a dog or cat's inner front leg, Bas kind of resembling our thumb. So they're not really functional, um, but they do kind of serve a purpose. And there is a bone there, which um, you can kind of see in this picture down there, that the dew claw is part of the paw that kind of creates what's similar to our hand. Um, in a dog or cat's paw, they have, you know, basically five fingers, and that dew claw acts like the thumb, just not functional. Um, and animals can have front and rear dew claws, sometimes even double dew claws, you know, on their rear dew claws. Um, the name dew claw, it's kind of a weird word, I know, but uh, I found out it's, it comes from being at the same level as blades of grass, which would hold the drops of dew in the morning. So um, the dew claw falls. If a dog is standing in the grass, you might just be able to see it um, peeking out from the top of the grass. And dew claws are attached to the ankle by a separate metacarpal bone and form a joint with the carpus. So while animals 
can't control their dew claws, you know, they don't have the ability like we do with our thumbs, but the dew claw still has some purpose and is thoroughly connected to the rest of the paw and um, ankle. So um, they think that the dew claw helps uh, a dog grasp objects with its paws and stabilize the ankle. Um, so this mostly seems to serve a purpose for working dogs, which do agility, racing, or climbing. But um, while it might be vestigial, meaning like not necessary, think like goosebumps and people are a vestigial um, body part. So a dew claw might be not needed in every breed, but it still has those muscles, tendons, nerves, and blood, blood supply like all the other toes. And it is, once again, fully attached to the carpus or ankle. So while a dew claw might not be as purposeful as it once was for working dogs, it still is important. And the only re reason you should ever remove a dew claw is if it's deformed or there's an injury to that area. So once again, that is a medical reason interesting to kind of show you that um, it's hard to always know for sure what um, an animal was born with. Some dogs have a naturally bobbed tail while a lot of breeds have dock tails. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a couple of pictures of different dog breeds and I want you to guess at home, you know, you can say the answer out loud to your computer screen um, if you think the animal was born this way or not. So we'll start with English Cocker Spaniel. This is the breed standard picture on the left, and I'll give you guys about five seconds to think. Do you think the English Cocker Spaniel is born this way? No, it is not. So their tail is uh, not docked um, when born naturally, but in the breed standard, they dock the Cocker Spaniel's tail. Next is the Doberman Pinscher. So that is the breed standard photo on the left. I'll give you five seconds if you think the Doberman Pinscher was born this way. So no, he was not very different. Um, he has an intact tail and ears on the right. So. Um, they, both the ears are cropped and tail is docked for the breed standard of Doberman Pinschers. So, but he looks so handsome on the right. There's really no reason to other than aesthetic reasons. You can tell the dog on the right is very happy and healthy. So next is the Boston Terrier. Do you think he is born this way? Nope. So the ears are not cropped on a natural born Boston Terrier. Next is the Australian Shepherd. So that is the breed standard on the left. So the Australian Shepherd is naturally bobbed, or there are some varieties at least that have a naturally bobbed tail. So they are born this way. However, there are varieties um, that get their tail docked, but usually um, they're born that way with a bobbed tail. Next is the Rottweiler. You would think the Rottweiler was born this way. And once again, this is kind of a tricky one, but the answer is kind of both. So there are instances where the tail is cropped, but there is also um, a variety of Rottweilers out there with a naturally bobbed tail. So if a 
bob's tail or short tail is something that's important to you, you can look up breeds with naturally occurring bobbed tails. Um, and sometimes it depends on the dog breed, like Rottweilers come in both varieties with a long tail and a bobbed tail. But um, once again, if that short tail is important to you, don't crop the tail, always go for a dog that was born that way.